21, 1 through 22, 5, and the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. <clears throat> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I don't know what that he said. <clears throat> and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who sits upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Also he said, Write this. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, to the thirsty I will give from the fountain of the water of life without payment. He who conquers shall have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he shall be my sons. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, as for murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot shall be the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. <clears throat> then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And in the spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates. At the gates, twelve angels, and on the gates, the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. And on the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city in its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its breadth, and he measured the city with his rod, twelve thousand fadia, its length and breadth and height were equal. He also measured his walls, a hundred and forty-four cubits, by a man's measure, that is, that is, an angel. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth the emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysalis, the eleventh jason, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of the Lord is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. And its gates shall never be shut by day, and there shall be no night there. They shall bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. <clears throat> then he showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, Flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall no more be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall worship him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And night shall be no more. They need no light for not the sun, for the Lord God, Lord God will be their light, and they shall reign forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
for a change, we're not going to deal with judgment and penalty. All the way through the book of the Revelation, there have been plagues and death and slaughter, and today we are on to more happier things. We are like the little boy who was picking out a puppy. His father told him he could get one. He's at the store, and he's looking over the dogs, and there's one that's jumping all over the place, and he's shaking, and he's happy, and uh, the little boy said, I want that one. One with a happy ending. Well, we are there. We are at the happy ending. We are going to look at the city of God this morning. And uh, I hope I can be half as excited as Debbie was to talk about this. Inside, I am like that dog. I'm jumping all over. I, it, this is just so wonderful to even think about. It. What is heaven like? That's a favorite topic for a lot of Christians and also unbelievers as well. One person said it pretty well. Heaven is a little like South Florida. There's great climate and everybody's got relatives there. Well, what is it going to be like? I've got for you this morning seven words uh, to describe the new city of God. So let's just go ahead and dig right in. The first is new things. What it's going to be like? It's going to be new things. We need to make the distinction here between heaven and the new Jerusalem. Heaven is God's throne. New Jerusalem is going to be an actual city, a real place, a wonderful new city that Christian believers are going to occupy. And in this chapter, John is using, as he does throughout, fulfillment language. Fulfillment language. What does that mean? Well, he's describing the indescribable. John can't imagine what he has seen, and he it, it is entirely impossible for someone, especially in that century, to even have a concept of what it is that he's trying to describe. And so he uses fulfillment language that says, in short, you don't have any idea what you're going to encounter there. I don't even know, and I've seen it, but it's going to be there. That's fulfillment language. It's futuristic, it's very definite, it's very reassuring, and it simply takes what the Bible says will come about and describes it as already having happened. The prophets used to use this manner of communicating about the future. They spoke about future events so forcefully it put them in the past tense. Instead of looking forward to it, they said it's done. We have an expression that we use, you can take that to the bank. What do we mean by that? It means that when we're so certain something is going to happen, it's a done deal. It hasn't happened yet, but it's a done deal. It's going to happen. John knew that New Jerusalem is more than a blessed hope. It is a certainty. New is not restricted to a sense of time in this passage. It includes new in the sense of kind. What are we talking about here? When God makes us new creatures in Christ, for instance, we're not just starting over in time. It's not just a reset. We are changed in kind. He changes us from a lost person to a saved person. We are transformed into something else. And so we're not just new in time. We are new in kind. Old ways of thinking pass off the scene. We love differently. We're being conformed to the image of Christ. Now, that is how you can tell the difference between somebody who truly got saved and somebody who's just playing church or somebody who quote unquote got religion. Somebody who has truly been born again, received new birth is a changed person. It's not just a clean slate. You see a new her or a new him. I've got a rabbit to chase here as we begin. You can't preach on heaven without certain things getting in the way. One question that always haunts people is, especially people who are grieving over having lost loved ones, is this. Will I know him or her in heaven? Will I know my wife? Will I know my husband, my brother, my mother, my grandparents? Will I know them when I get to heaven? I want to give you what I consider to be the best answer I've ever heard on that subject came more than 100 years ago from that great Baptist preacher, G. Campbell Morgan. He was asked that question, right? Are you going to know your wife? 
Morgan's, uh, J. Campbell Morgan's wife had just died when this question was asked. Will you know your wife out there? And Morgan replied this. He said, I do not expect to be a bigger fool in heaven than I am here, and I know my loved ones here. <laughs> I like that. Okay, let's take a look at, with that method chased, uh, let's take a look. Over the next three sermons, we're going to look at this passage, this same passage, Revelation chapter 21 and the first five verses of 22. We look at this passage under the general heading, City of God, and there are three topics in view. I'm going to take them one week at a time. Uh, this Sunday is uh, the new place for the people of God. Next, or not next Sunday, because I won't be here next Sunday, but the following Sunday, the new people in the city of God. And then the third sermon will be the new fulfillment of the purpose of God. So we've got a lot of new to look forward to and no plagues and no sickness and no death, no penalties for the next few weeks. Now, if you'll recall our time reference here, let me set the stage for us. Armageddon is over, Satan has been defeated, and he's been thrown into the lake of the fire, the lake of fire. The great white throne judgment has passed, and everybody who rejected Christ, all of them are now in the lake of fire with the devil. The millennial rule of Christ has been consummated, a thousand years of Jesus on earth. Time has ceased. Believers are now perched on the edge of eternity. John has a new vision, and he's shown the new Jerusalem, a new earth, and heaven. Behold, God says, I make all things new. So word number one, new things. Word number two, it's going to be a new size. A new size. You know, that should hold significance for a lot of us as we get a little bit older and a little bit more sedentary. We have new sizes to entertain I was thinking about my grandchildren. My grandchildren, almost all of them, wear shoes bigger than I do now. I mean, those kids grow so fast and so big, it's incredible. But heaven is going to be a new size from a lot of different perspectives. This new Jerusalem, the new city of Jerusalem, the city is immense. It's different in kind in the sense that it's not a flat parcel, it's cubicle. We're so accustomed to square miles as a measurement, but that just measures two directions, wide and long. It doesn't say anything about high. The angel tells John the city is 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, but it's also 1,500 miles high. That is a large high rise, my friends. Interesting fact about the shape, though, is that it's the same as the altar of the temple in Exodus chapter 27. It's cubicle. An altar is what? It's a place of worship. Scripture says that there is no temple in this city and there's no need for a representation, which is what the temple is. There's no need for a representation. We have the real thing. And you can say that because Jesus is absolutely the center of New Jerusalem. We find that out in these two chapters. How big is it? How big is it? Well, we know 1,500 miles by wide. But... How big is it really? It's big enough. For all the purposes of God, it's big enough. It's just right. New Jerusalem is probably one of those things John had trouble understanding and describing because he had never encountered anything this wonderful. After all, John had never even seen a toaster. How in the world could he comprehend a multi-level city suspended in air? Which I believe is what it's going to look like. Well, John understand the least bit about our orbiting satellites? No. He had described the entire world viewing events in this book of the Revelation. Remember it says so that the entire world saw the return of Jesus. The, everybody saw the prophet, the dead prophet laying in the streets. Everybody saw the killing of the two witnesses. He was describing television. But John didn't know anything about electronic circuitry, about broadcast patterns. It's going to be a new size. It's going to be a new game in town. The third word that we have is a new spot, a new place, if you will. Where is this city going to be located? Although honest people disagree about the location, I'm going to add my thought to the pot. 
but I've already hinted at it. I believe that this city will be like today's orbiting satellites. The new city of Jerusalem is going to be suspended in a stationary orbit directly over the old Jerusalem. They are going to be connected. When it says, uh, Debbie, and I, I have a slightly different view on this, when it says that heaven and earth fled away, that's a euphemism for the worldly system fleeing away. I do not believe what God has created and is about to recreate that he's going to then destroy. I believe that the old Jerusalem and the new Jerusalem are absolute representations of what's going to be. And I believe the new Jerusalem is going to be suspended in a stationary orbit directly over the old Jerusalem. And in my mind's camera, I can see the two cities connected by what Scripture calls, you ready for this, streets of gold. Now, is it actually a street? No, I think John is using the only language he has available. He can't imagine teleportation or beaming up and down on Star Trek, right? Beam me up, Holy Spirit. No, you know, John didn't have any understanding of that. But I do believe that the golden street is a figurative picture in John's mind. It's a first century picturesque description of incredibly fast communication and transportation between the two cities. And I'd say, wait a minute, Russell. You know, you, you get into, uh, you know, science fiction on me here. You know, give me some Bible on this. Well, does the scripture say that God is going to resurrect the dead? That's pretty weak, church. Is God going to resurrect the dead? It resurrect the dead? Yes. yes. Okay. Just Christians or all? All right. Some to reward and some to a different kind of reward, right? Now, how's it going to do that? When people die, do they say exactly as we see them and we remember them? Do their bodies remain the same? No. How's it going to do that? We don't know, do we? But we do know that in the twinkling of an eye, Scripture says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then God is going to take the church off planet Earth to meet with Jesus in the ark. Does that not sound like something that God can do? Can God do that? If he can do that, what is to prevent him from setting this 1,500 mile wide long and high city in the sky directly over New Jerusalem? That's just my thought. But imagine, if you will, planet Earth and old Jerusalem. Hovering overhead, there's this great transparent city. It's as wide and long and high as half the American continent. One city. And there's a great, wide, golden pathway emanating out of that city all the way down to old Jerusalem. And it comes right from the person of Jesus, the center of everything in that new city. It extends all the way to the old Jerusalem. And in that stream of Christ-lit golden mist, believers, kings, rulers of heaven and earth are traveling and talking. What are they doing? Here's where the Bible comes in, Revelation 21 and verse 24. They are walking in the light of the Lamb and bringing glory and honor to the Lamb. Eon upon eternity, it never stops. So we have new things. We have a new spot, and we have a new word. And fourthly, we have a new spot. Genesis tells us in the beginning, God created a new start, I should say. <clears throat> Genesis, uh, the first verse in the Bible, tells us in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And the scripture ends in this 22nd chapter with God recreating that which has been soiled by evil. The new city of God is set in a new heaven, not physically, but a heaven untouched by sin. The thing that's going to flee from our presence, from God's presence, is all sin, is all evil. If God is going to dwell with man in earth, sin cannot be part of that equation. What does God say? I will not encounter sin. I will not put up with sin. The city is said to be four square, Revelation 22, 16. And it says 
It's four square, and it, to the Greeks, four square meant good, and that's what a new start is all about. It's a good thing to start anew, isn't it? The psalmist says it. He tells us that God's mercies are new every single day. The prophets also tell us that God does new things. How different, I think, this thing about new starts, about new things, how different from the epitaph written over so many church doors, we've never done it this way before. God is the author of new things. The new start means many old things are going to pass away. Holiness is going to be restored to the physical environment. Did you ever think? Did you ever sit and just muse, imagine? Did you ever just contemplate on what this world would be like if it was totally changed into a holy environment? If people stopped acting with anger and fierce wrath? If people were kind and generous and good to one another? It would be the condition of holiness. Death, tears, and murder will all be faded memories. In this account, the jewels mentioned as the construction materials, like the way Debbie put it, one gigantic pearl for each gate. Wow! Yeah, those are some big pearls. If you think about a city gate, one pearl? You've never seen anything like that. But there's something about the construction material here, the city's walls, all of those, there were 12 of them that David mentioned, they are in the exact reverse order of the jewels as they appeared on the breastplate of the high priest. And also the ancient zodiac, exactly reversed. What does this mean? It's a representation that in that day, when God changes all things, he is gonna turn this world on its ear. It's going to be so different. We are going to be so different. There's going to be a new start. God is going to reverse the old things. They'll pass away. New will be holy and pure. New will be life and joy. But not only will there be new things and a new size and a new spot and a new start, but fifthly, there's going to be a new sight. There's going to be a new sight aesthetically. Revelation as a message alive with colors and light and jewels and shining things. John said the city was like a bride that was all dressed up for her husband. As a pastor, I have performed more than a few weddings. I have never yet met an ugly bride. <laughs> Trust me, I have never seen an ugly bride. There's just something about that moment. They're, they're all beautiful. The groom's mama well, I can tell you this, she will look at that boy and say, boy, nothing ever fine, but everybody else in the room is looking at that bride. Isn't that the truth? I mean, it's the bride's day, let's face it. New Jerusalem's bridal appearance means that it's going to be different from any other city that's ever been seen, aesthetically beautiful. But it's also going to be a new site environmentally. These verses tell us that we're going to know a new heaven and a new earth. Not just new start, but new in kind. I don't believe that these will be so much new in location as in purity. Now, before you lump me in with the kind of fruitcakes you want to preserve the spotted owls at a cost of $100,000 while the children go hungry, please understand we do have a problem right now with our ecological balance. It's hard to ignore that in the world. We live in a sin-touched world that makes it a polluted world. And we are cooperating with that polluting, polluting every time. I tell you what, every time I, I, I drive past a, a, a place on the side of the road where the garbage has been strewn, my heart wants to break. Why? Because that's going exactly against what God has talked about with, with us being stewards. It's not just stewardship in a matter of, like if you throw a piece of paper out on the road that someone's going to get sick and die over it. But what does it do to our thought patterns? It changes us. When we look at that ugliness on the side of the road, it translates into all the rest of life, doesn't it? We need to do better than that. But until that time, we need to do better than that. But in that time, God is going to do so much better than that. These verses tell us that we're going to know a new heaven 
and new earth in purity. In God's creation, over which we were to be good stewards, we've instead polluted the streams and rivers to the point that sometimes walking on water is not a miracle anymore in some places, and our atmosphere is in trouble too. I heard about an eighth grader who changed his poetry recital accordingly about the, uh, the atmosphere. He said, I shot an arrow into the air and it stuck. <laughs> well, this change in the New Jerusalem is going to be what's recorded in Revelation 21, verse 27. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter. There's going to be a new look. There's going to be a new sight to it all. God is going to see to the purity level, and it's going to be a wonderfully clean place to live. So we have new things. We have new size, a new spot, a new start, a new sight. And number six, we have a new security. There's going to be a new international security in heaven that we have not understood before. Throughout the ages, nations have fought over territory and resources. And every now and then, my wife and I, as we're sitting, we have a conversation to talk about how uh, back in the days of Andy and Opie, you know, in the 50s and 60s, where we grew up, and by the way, we grew up in New York, and it was there was no crime where we grew up. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, Crime was the exception rather than the rule, all right? And we grew up on dirt roads and little small town, just very much like Seagrove. Uh, Smithtown was a town where we had in common, where we grew up, and that little place was, uh, you know, very, very small town, about 20,000, I guess, about the time we um, hit it. Uh, and both of us lived out in the country. We didn't live in the city limits. But we were thinking about how uh, how safe it was and how, you know, we didn't think anything about playing in the woods, walking at night. I mean, these things happened far away from us, the bad stuff. Well, New Jerusalem is going to be a place where all of the nations are finally going to live in harmony with each other. There's not going to be any more Russian invasion of Ukraine world wars. Politicians in every century have tried for peace. We've had war to end all wars. They didn't. We've had government programs and poverty and racism and hatred, and it didn't end any of it. What a welcome sight to new tired eyes when the lion nations lie down with the land countries. There's not going to be any more bomb shelters, no more D DMZs, no checkpoints. The gates of the city are going to be open wide day and night, and there's no fear. No fear. Can you imagine living without fear? There's a lady in Memphis who was so concerned about her safety, she finally bought a pistol. She carried it in her purse, and I get a witness. She came out of the mall one day, and there was a man sitting behind the steering wheel of her car. She pulled that pistol out, she pointed it in, she said, get out of my car! And the guy got wide-eyed, he opened the car and he ran. She got inside the car, but the kid wouldn't start in <laughs> her car. <laughs> Can you imagine living without the kind of fear that makes you do goofy stuff? City Hall and a new government, the new Jerusalem, not going to issue permits to carry guns because they won't be any guns. Not on the streets, not in the schools. Matter of fact, there won't even be any police. Sorry, bud, you're at a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if only, right? There won't be any child or spouse abuse. There's not going to be any locks on doors. You won't even need a pin number for your ATM card because you won't have an ATM card. Everything is going to be free because Jesus is going to see to every need that we have. So there's going to be word number seven, which is describing all of this, a new glory, new glory. Revelation chapter 22, verses one through five, David read it well, but it's too good not to read again at this point. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, and it flowed down the center of the main street. 
On each side of the river grew a tree of life. You know, we always hear this thing about tree of life. We think about one tree. Uh-huh. Both sides of the river, as far as 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, and 1,500 miles high, where the river flows all throughout, there'll be the tree of life. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. For the throne of God and the land will be there, and his servants will worship him. I believe that that throne of God is going to be in the center of New Jerusalem, but it's going to be available, it's going to be in view from anywhere in the city. And it's going to be accessible from anywhere in the city because you will not move by walking your legs. You will move at thought. We will move at thought sight, sight thought. We will move at the speed of thought. Wherever you are in the universe, you want to be with the Lord and speak to him about a situation, your thinking will bring you right into his presence. Anytime God wants to see you, suddenly you'll be there. Like the disciples in the upper room after the resurrection, suddenly he was among them. You know, if God could do that in the midst of those apostles, he's going to create that for all of us. And they will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads and there will be no night there. No need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Oh, if you are not at least thinking, hallelujah, you say it out loud, so you'll start thinking. Over the hallway, there's a sign in the Duke Divinity School. There's a mural there with the words of John Wesley. It says, best of all, these are his last words, by the way, Best of all, God is with us. John Wesley's last words. Well, best of all, in the New Jerusalem, we are going to get the one thing that has been absent from this life is the sight of the face of Jesus. And there's no temple in the new city because Jesus and the Father are the temple. They're the center of it all. And God, the Holy Spirit's fire, is the warmth of eternal love. Janet was talking about uh, the Holy Spirit to the children in, uh, in confirmation class this morning. She was talking about when she got saved, the, the Spirit's fire just warmed her up. And that's what it's going to be all throughout eternity. The presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit simply inspires worship and love and obedience. The New Jerusalem is going to be a wonderful place. Can you imagine moving into New Jerusalem? My wife and I have moved a passel of times in our married life, 23 times to be exact. And I've enjoyed some of those moves, and I've, uh, I've dreaded others. But the new places we found ourselves in, we tried to work on making as good as we could. I tell you what, there's no thinking about moving into New Jerusalem that doesn't bring a smile to my face, no warmth to my heart. It's a new home we're talking about, new in time, new in kind. It's going to be so different. I want you to do some holy imagining with me for just a moment. Can you imagine living without shame, without guilt, without sadness for past sins? Can you imagine living without sinful thoughts? Can you imagine slipping out to do good things just because doing good feels so good? Can you imagine living with complete trust toward other people? Can you imagine never losing your temper again? Somebody say amen. (laughs) New Jerusalem is going to be just like that. It'll be a wonderful place to live. The little girl was walking with her father at the nighttime, early crisp evening, no clouds in the sky. She's looking up. She said, oh, Daddy, if heaven looks like this from the wrong side, can you imagine what it looks like from the right side? 
we only have a meager understanding of what our home and heaven is going to be like, but some people are willing to settle for so little in this life. Paul Eisinger is a professional golfer. You've heard of the book. He's a dedicated Christian man. He's less of a golfer these days than a commentator. I was listening to him on one of the golf tournament shows that was broadcast this past weekend. <clears throat> He wrote a book of, uh, some years ago after he had a major struggle with lymphatic cancer. He wrote about it and how his priorities have changed so dramatically. And this is what he wrote. He said, my friend Mike got on an airplane one day and saw one of the strangest things he'd ever seen in his life. The man sitting next to him in first class was dressed in a bathrobe and slippers. The man's seat was a beautiful leather chair, but my friend's mine was simply made of fabric. The man said to my friend, I see you've noticed my chair, chair, made of the finest leathers money can buy. And then my friend noticed that the man had a mahogany tray table. Again, the man said, aha, you've noticed my gorgeous tray table. My friend looked up and saw that the guy had a ceiling fan. The rich man also had I was surrounded by a VCR, TV, CD player, computer. And Paul's friend Mike was flabbergasted. And he asked that rich man, why would anyone go to the expense to have all these things installed in an airplane? And the man replied bluntly, because this is my home. And Mike thought, what a shame. A place that was intended to be a journey he has made home. Wouldn't that be sad? But how many people think of this world as their home? Your home is not this world. Does the old song say, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. So how appropriate for us to remember that the place that we're now living in and on is not our home. We're looking for a new home, a new Jerusalem, the city of God, and it's going to be glory, all glory. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.